Hey everyone, this is Ian from Unincorporated, and I just wanted to welcome you to the Higher Ed Happy Hour. I'm really excited to sit down today with James Follows. He is a longtime correspondent of the Atlantic Magazine and is the author of numerous books, including the national bestseller, Our Towns, uh, which was also made into an HBO documentary. Previous to that, James was the editor of US News and World Report, and he served as President Jimmy Carter's chief speechwriter for two years. Today, James is here to talk with us about a recent article in the Washington Monthly titled, Reviving America, One College at a Time. Excuse me, let me repeat that. Today, James is here to talk with us about his recent article in the Washington Monthly titled, Reviving America, One College Town at a Time, and how this symbiotic relationship between colleges and their communities have reaped rewards in Erie, Pennsylvania. James, welcome to the show. Um, Ian, thanks so much. I'm glad to talk with you. Absolutely. So let's get started with just a little bit of context. What was the impetus for writing about the potential of college towns in America's revival? So I think the long version background was that over the last 10 years, my wife, Deb, and I had been traveling around the country in our little propeller plane, looking at smaller towns and or smaller towns or, quote, left behind, quote, unquote, towns, seeing what were the traits that distinguished the ones that were making it from the ones that were not? And there are a lot of things that have nothing to do with higher ed that were involved in that. But there are a couple of things that did specifically involve higher ed. And one of them was the way in which um, colleges and universities of different kinds, either big research universities with all they bring to a town or liberal arts colleges or even um, you know two-year colleges, the way in which they'd become this era's version of a port or a river confluence or something that was a huge natural advantage for uh, towns to use and how the symbiosis between colleges and universities and communities, how that was evolving now. I see. And did that insight or that interest, did that stem from the work that you were doing on the Our Towns book and documentary? Uh, it, yes, it was. And so it was, again, the, the, the breadth of, of factors that allow smaller U.S. communities or deindustrialized communities to recover is quite broad. And it ranges from things like physical location and whether climate changes are going to help or hurt a community and whether the agricultural base is rising or falling or whatever. But also there's the intentional way in which communities can work with educational institutions to draw students to a town, to draw faculty members to a town, to um, uh, increase and um, maximize the, uh, the, the existing traits of the town. F just to give one example, we spent a lot of time in, a lot of time in, time in Fresno, California. And those of your listeners who are from California, like me, will recognize that Fresno is part of the interior. It's one of the less um, Malibu-like parts of the California um, landscape. But Fresno State, which is there, and some other institutions have been working with the agricultural establishment all around Fresno to say, what is high-tech ag? Uh, ag? What are ways in which we can have people whose parents might have been field workers become entrepreneurs or tech people or whatever? So, yes, seeing that in our, our town's work um, extended to saying more generally, how are the fates of colleges and universities tied to their communities uh, and they, the, the ways they can either help or hurt uh, one another. Yeah, that's right. Well, I know in the article you talk uh, pretty specifically about how the last five decades where you see many blue collar industrial towns like Erie, Pennsylvania shrink in population because manufacturing or other businesses have left. And yet these same towns, some of which have, seen a like a revitalization over the past decade because in part of these local colleges so you you speak a bit about the intentional ways that the institution can be part of this revitalization can you walk us through some of those intentional ways uh yes and can i take a detour to muncie indiana would that be sure. or should we yeah. save that total so the way in which i think this um issue became into sharp focus for deb and me was about a year ago when we were in muncie indiana which as many of your listeners know is the home of ball state university and muncie the town of muncie is famous in sociology 
uh, for the as the site of the Middletown studies, you know, a century ago now. It's famous in manufacturing. Anybody who's ever used one of the Ball Brothers glass jars for canning or beer cans these days, uh, you know, has has knows about Muncie and, and the, the home of uh, of a Ball State University. And over the last couple of decades, um, Muncie had been a sort of long industrial town, Midwestern, quote, classic, unquote, uh, decline uh, that, that many uh, older industrial communities ha had been through. And over the last now less than a decade, but in the last, uh, say, six or eight years, a new president of Ball State University, Jeffrey Mearns, uh, and his wife decided that if they were to come to Ball State, what they cared about was having the community and the university rise or fall together, that if Ball State were to succeed, Muncie itself had to become a more vibrant and attractive place for students, for faculty members, for administrators. And so in a whole saga I won't give to you now, um, Ball State launched something that is still, to my best of my knowledge, unique in modern U.S. history, which is a public university taking responsibility for a public K-12 elementary uh, school system in the city of Muncie. Uh, Boston University and the Chelsea schools, as many people know, did that before, but that was a private university. And so that got her attention of how a college or university can try to sort of make its own luck for the uh, people around it. And that led us after a number of months to um, Erie, Pennsylvania, where we'd been many times. And Erie is a place uh, that has tried many ways to get ahead, including welcoming refugees. But one very important part of its formula has been Gannon University, a private Catholic university, which also declared that its future was Erie's future and vice versa, that if Erie didn't prosper, then Gannon could not uh, as well. And under its um, President uh, Keith Taylor over the last uh, you know number of years, it's really thrown itself into the community with benefits for both of them. I see. So from Muncie to Erie, you've seen a couple very specific ways that the university has taken ownership of the success of these small towns. And I like that idea that we rise and fall together and we're mutual partners in this endeavor. In the case of Gannon University, did they also take interest in the public K through 12 system in Erie? <laughs> They didn't have the same kind of formal takeover that Ball State did in Muncie. And again, I don't know of any other case in the U.S. right now of a public university taking over the public schools. And that's a whole – it was a whole – kind of dance of legislation process they did in Indiana to get community involvement, state, uh, the state government's involvement, the, uh, the ball state involvement. And that is something w we can talk about in with Erie and with Gannon. It was more of a, um, an organic and less structurally formal connection where um, Gannon University, for example, decided that its new dormitories and, um, and classroom buildings would be downtown. Erie, like so many places in the U.S., had all this development on the fringe and the old historic Good Bones downtown was being increasingly hollowed out. And so Gannon, which was downtown, decided we will put our money where our heart is and our money will be in building new buildings downtown. Uh, they have, uh, Gannon has sponsored a, a big a project making itself a research center on the role of the Great Lakes in America's climate changed future. Uh, there's a whole separate um, <laughs> analysis about whether America's next coast will be the Great Lakes coast, whether Toledo and Sandusky and Erie and Buffalo and places like this, because will be favored by climate as opposed to disfavored by climate, as they have been for for so long, so long a time. Um, Gannon integrated almost all of its training programs and um, and practical business partnerships to the town of Erie and ways in which there could be apprenticeships um, in a non-exploitative exploitative way and business partnerships and all the rest to um, to make uh, to have students learn about business innovation and to have them learn it in Erie and with Erie business people. And the idea was um, Gannon's strategic problem, like many smaller colleges and universities, would be if its surrounding town continued to deteriorate, people wouldn't come there. 
not administrators, not faculty members, not students. So if they could make um, if they could make Erie a more happening place for all of those people and place for research, a place for culture, a place for a sense of the future, then again, you have the rising tide. You have the virtuous circle as opposed to the vicious circle that some places say. Yeah, absolutely. In addition to these two examples, have you looked at other towns where you've seen a success model such as these? Uh, yes, and I'll mention another that I also discussed in the Washington Monthly. That's um, Waterville, Maine, <laughs> and and Colby College. And Colby, of course, is a well-known private um, private college. Um, I had not known. I'll say that I had known of Waterville in the long run for extremely oddball reasons. When <laughs> my wife was in high school from a small high school in Ohio, she decided that she was too big for this, this little town and she wanted to go off to a uh, boarding school. And there was one of those boarding schools then in Waterville, Maine, in this gigantic sort of decaying Charles Adams style mansion in Waterville. So she was there, there for a year. And Waterville has had its ups and downs and it has been like, again, many northern manufacturing towns had seen the business base of its employment go away, the mills go away. Colby College recognized um, that a, a century ago, Colby itself had been saved by the city of Waterville. Colby had a sort of constrained location between the railroad tracks where it couldn't grow. It was thinking of moving to Augusta. And the citizens of Waterville, these working class people from a mill raise money to buy Colby, the location it still has up on a on a higher elevation, you know, very, very attractive place. And so Colby thought this is our karmic duty that Colby, uh, that Waterville, when we needed them a century ago, helped us. Colby will help the town now, among other reasons for the self-interest of making Waterville a place that people who might otherwise go to name two dozen other fancy uh, private colleges, instead of going to those places, going to Amherst, let's say, or going to Walla Walla for, um, for uh, uh, Whitman College, or going to any of the other places would think, yes, Waterville is where we wanna go. So they invested, they raised money for downtown improvement, for dorms downtown, for a cultural center downtown. So I think that Waterville, Maine, and Colby College are a place to go to see what this symbiosis can look like. Those are excellent, really nice examples there. You mentioned that oftentimes this is more of an organic relationship or development versus a structural or kind of focused strategic uh, plan. Given that nature of it being somewhat organic, is there actually a specific recommendation that you would provide to, say, a president or a provost who is looking or considering making an investment in the town? That's that's a great question. Thank you. And, and, and I've been thinking about this in background processing, you know, for years and, and for the for the last while, knowing I was, I was going to talk with you. And I think it involves both a involves, I think, a three tier um, connected set of approaches by by uh, by higher ed leaders. One is simply the mindset of recognizing that where you are for better and worse becomes who you are, that a university or a college can't thrive in the long run, separated from walled off against its community. Um, we can all think of higher education institutions that have tried to do that. I could name you 10 right now, but I'm not going to, <laughs> of places that decide, come to us despite our being in place X. And so the, the, the change of mindset is to realize that it needs to be come to us because we're in place X. And place X is where you want to be, where you want to spend your career, the next four years, the next two years, et cetera. Place X is where you'll expand uh, all of your opportunities. You'll make connections. You'll see the world. So first is that that mindset of thinking that we don't happen to be here. We are here. We are of here, that this is us. And the place is not just in our name. The place is our identity and our future, and that we're going to be really rowing against the current 
in the long run if the current is moving against our place as opposed to our finding ways to reverse the current, if you will. A, a strained metaphor, but you can at least, <laughs> you can at least uh, stop a, a, a negative uh, current. Um, a second, you know, sort of consequence of that is simply a rhetorical one of having the presentations within the institution to the community and to the larger world be of institution and place, as opposed to those being two really separate things. So that the institution is of the place, people coming to the institution are going to that place. Uh, the institution wants them to be, feel as if they're in that community, its welfare matters to them, it matters to everybody. So first there is the thought, second there is the word, then third there is the deed of having ways to uh, connect um, classes, faculty members, students, um, applicants to the surrounding environment. I'll, I'll give an example from um, my own hometown of Redlands, California, which is in inland Southern California uh, near San Bernardino. Uh, most people know it as they're driving on the way to Palm Springs from uh, Los Angeles to Palm Springs. They'll go through Redlands. But if you're not going, if you are in Redlands rather than going through Redlands, you would see that the University of Redlands has been trying increasingly to have people think the reason to come here, not Whittier, not Occidental, not Claremont, not um, Pepperdine in Southern California is, is because we're connected to this community. We're doing sustainability projects with our students. We're doing, we have a very inventive um, public service project to do uh, teaching in the, in the schools, which are very ethnically um, distinct schools. It's, it's a um, mixed Anglo, Latino, uh, other community, and, and the university is playing a part in that. So I think thought of recognizing the university's fate in the community, word in saying that, and deed in doing it with students, with faculty, with uh, programs, uh, with, with um, cultural institutions, with anything that can make uh, the, the institution and the place seem whole rather than separate. That is my hope. Well, you've outlaid a very nice three-step plan, and I love the idea of thought, word, and action being those three pillars of what goes into that plan. I also love this uh, beautiful quote that you left us with, which is, where you are becomes who you are, and you are of here. And just having that recognition, I, I think, is um, very poignant. So let's assume <laughs> I'm going to take your uh, counsel here and put thought word and action into play, why would I do that? What Lay out some of the rewards that the institution would then receive in return. I think it's, again, that's an excellent question, and it involves, as with so many other things, the tiers and the unequal structures and incentives of American higher education as American life, et cetera. There is a tier of institutions that are so rich and have such brand name established pedigree that they could argue they don't have to care about place-based issues. I think that's short-sighted for any of them. Um, and and I'll, I'll give an example. Um, my wife and I have lived many years of our life outside the US. We lived in China for about four years, lived, lived in Japan for many years. and. Aspirational students who are ambitious in those uh, those countries, of course, go through the dreaded U.S. News ranking list. Side note, I was once the editor of U.S. News. We can talk about that later <laughs> and how uh, that's like I was once head of a, a cartel. But <laughs> it's uh, so that they, they look through all these lists of name brand American universities and it does matter in their decisions where they are. That, that is it a place where their parents who hear about the U.S. as a place of violence and threat and carnage and all the rest, is it some place where their students want, want to be? So even the most, the richest and most um, favored institutions, uh, even they are affected by by their locations. But if you if you exempt about you know eight or ten 
really rich institutions from the thousands of U.S. Uh, higher institutions, basically all of the rest. A number one, a part of who wants to come there involves where they are that where will students be living? What will students be exposed to? What else will they learn uh, when they're not studying, which uh, happens to be a lot of their time? Uh, so for students, how will their parents feel? Will their parents feel about their children going there, coming back for events, et cetera, et cetera? So, so one is simply remaining attractive for the great majority of American uh, colleges and universities that are not the subject of this crazy admissions pressure, and that, but need to, to make sure they have an adequate flow of people coming in. Um, second, and crucially, is for faculty members. And it's not simply whether faculty members will take jobs there. It's whether they will live there. And it makes all the difference in the world, as your audience knows, to have people who are not just there during working hours and then driving away, but who are there. And you see them in the restaurant and you see them in the grocery store and you see them on the street and they feel as this is their community. And that was something that uh, David Green, the president of, of Colby, was telling me that that it made all the difference in, in sort of building up the sense of Waterville as a town that faculty members wanted to be there. They weren't commuting from Portland. They weren't commuting from even suburban Boston if they were doing it for um, a couple of days a week. But they thought they were of there. So having the kind of community and culture uh, that makes an ins institution, especially small liberal arts colleges, but really any of them, feel whole and not just a place where people work, but that they are part of. You know, that, that, that's why uh, place matters. And then I think there's also the, the, the sort of the, the more uh, dollars and cents um, you know, issue that Higher ed of all kinds, research, you know, me, uh, research institutions, community colleges, liberal arts, you know, wh whatever uh, part of, uh, of the, um, the the spectrum you're on, um, th that they're, they make a big difference in how the surrounding area prospers or doesn't. There are spin-off businesses. There is training for students and working in local enterprises. There is the attraction for people to come there because they have a certain kind of workforce. There just is the synergy that comes with students and teachers and business people in the community being able to do something. So I think in terms of attracting students, attracting faculty who want to be there as opposed to working there and being part of a growing rather than declining a region. Those are all ways in which it's in the direct self-interest of the people who lead um, higher education to care about where they are in the broad sense, as opposed to where they are in the moat-like sense. Yeah, that's a very thoughtful and thorough answer. Thank you. <laughs> it made me think of so my alma mater is USC, and it made me think of a few key decisions that I observed while I was considering going to, to USC, one of which was they owned the beautiful, pristine Malibu property where Pepperdine is, and they made a strategic decision to leave Malibu, <laughs> this beautiful, heaven-like place in California, and go to downtown Los Angeles, which at the time was less than de desirable. And then even once they moved the campus, they made a strategic decision not to advance or develop uh, any of their residential college west of a street called Hoover, which gets into West LA and some of the more affluent parts of Los Angeles. And they made a concerted decision to, we're actually going to develop north of uh, toward Figueroa, toward downtown, and then east of Figueroa into, again, parts of the less than desirable places of, of LA. And that was a huge commitment and maybe at the time was seen as a unwise decision when you're looking at the asset of the land in Malibu or the asset of building into a more affluent part of Los Angeles. And I'm sure that at a certain point in that trajectory and that development, that strategic plan, places to live and how they were developing was less than attractive to faculty or students or parents. So in that transition, I, my question gets to the, this idea of in that transition, how do you make it attractive for faculty and staff 
and parents to uh, to kind of buy in or, or live residentially in that area. So, Ian, that is a fascinating example. And let me ask you just to follow up. Who was what was the leadership? Who was the leadership of USC at that time? Yeah, well, during the time where they decided to advance east of Figueroa Boulevard and north toward downtown, that was President Sample. And hmm. then prior to that um, tenure, I'm not sure who made the decision about Malibu, but I do know that moving east was part of the development, economic development council's um, kind of collaboration that they did with USC. And so I think that, that again, I, I grew up in Southern California, but in a different part from Los Angeles. Again, I grew up, uh, you know, 70 miles east and in, in uh, San Bernardino County. And so I, I always had the kind of Rube's sense of Los Angeles. So I'd go in to watch USC versus US UCLA games at the Rose Bowl or whatever, but I looked with um, some trepidation on both of the institutions. But I think that was a really, my guess is that historically that will be seen as a wise and foresighted move for USC. Um, difficult as it might have been at the time, because as you think of similar examples, in New Haven with Yale and in Greater Cambridge and Somerville and Alston with Harvard and for the University of Pennsylvania in, in Philadelphia, ways in which universities that have a lot of assets decide that they're going to take onto their shoulders some of the responsibility for the larger metropolis. I think universities that have tried to do that as opposed to walling themselves off, and I have two big examples in mind that I'm not going to use, <laughs> but it's uh, one of them is in the Midwest. I'll just leave it at, at that. One of them is in the South, uh, that there are, that, that history will recognize their leaders and their trustees and the other people who worked with them as, as having done the right thing for their institutions, for their communities, for the country, for their student body, of recognizing that you can't exist as a little globule in a surrounded, uh, troubled area, that your responsibility and part of the challenge for your students and part of your opportunity in education in all of its senses is to make the community's welfare a part of your welfare too. So I um, really admire the big institutions that have taken on responsibility for surrounding often troubled communities. Yeah, agreed. And maybe in your answer there, the, the inflection or, or what I inferred is that it requires vision. And so maybe, and a bit of trust. And so maybe just communicating that vision to those key stakeholders, to your, you know, that desired faculty or research um, faculty member that you're trying to recruit getting them to see part of that vision and be willing to make the sacrifice alongside of you. And, and yes, and I realized you are very gently reminding me that I didn't answer your question. <laughs> so I, I will now um, try to actually answer it. Yes, that, that I think that part of the mission of a university leadership is, again, the sort of um, thought, word, and deed sequence that of, of having the words that let people understand their institution's best future. And I, I think that in the two examples we were talking, in the three examples we've been talking about before, Colby College and its leadership in Waterville, Gannon University and its leadership in Erie, and Ball State and its leadership in Muncie, Indiana, each of those leaders has gone out of his way, his in all these cases, to speak within the institution to big uh, gatherings of, of higher ed within the community, to state legislatures, to the national media saying, here is why we're taking this difficult and expensive and potentially risky step. Anything that matters in life is potentially risky. If it weren't, everybody would do it. And it's, it's um, so making the case, giving people an idea of why both what the, what the vision and possibility are of how a community could be better if the university does, does its job, what the practical steps are of what we're going to do next year and 10 years from now, and here's what your, where your money is going, going to go, and also then what, what the consequences are of how things can be, would be different for the university and the community 
you know, into the future, uh, if if it goes in the broader way rather than the narrow narrow narrower way, and I'll say that in in each, uh, I'll just mention each of the cases because it's interesting in how uh, you present the the information. Again, in Colby's case, uh, the president David Green could say that it was a century ago that Waterville saved us. Now we are going to help Waterville. There was that historical continuity. In the case of Gannon with, with uh, Keith Taylor, he could say when this institution was founded and named for Archbishop Gannon, I believe it was a title, but a, a major Catholic figure in, in Erie, its role was to provide opportunity for working people in this part of the world. And now we're going to find ways to, to do that. In the case of uh, Ball State and Jeffrey Mearns, its president, he was saying when the Ball brothers donated this land, to form a university, again, roughly a century ago, let's say, they had an idea of their duty to this area. Now we are returning that that um, that obligation, not that favor, but that that responsibility. And so I think that that arguing why this is necessary, what the plan is, and what it can lead to, those are things where university leaders have a a responsibility and an opportunity. You are a true professional. <laughs> Nothing gets by you, young man. You are coming back around to that question and getting that answer spot on. Thank you. Thank you. So you covered responsibility, risk, but then also the reward of making both the town and the gown a priority and some of the factors on, on how to convey that message. I absolutely, absolutely I love that. Is there anything else you would like to add or share in terms of guidance to uh, to those listening? I I think that I am a person. <laughs> I have been to college, but I'm I <laughs> I'm not sort of of the academy. You know, I, I went to graduate school for a couple of years. I've taught a number of times at universities for one semester or one year long writing courses, which I've enjoyed. But I'm not. I'm a guy outside the culture that you are uh, in the center of here. So as an outsider, but as a citizen, I will say that what I hope university leaders, and by university, I mean all institutions of higher ed, research universities, other four years, two years, private liberal arts, whatever, people who have standing as leading the training for America's future, I would hope these people would recognize, again, the combination of opportunity and responsibility they have. Opportunity in that this is a time where, as some people might have noticed, authority is under challenge and doubt and what is actually true and et cetera, et cetera. And there is still a better standing that university leaders have than most people to make a case. They're not immediately dismissed as partisan. They're thought to have uh, some credentials behind them, et cetera. So there's the opportunity to be people who speak for the larger interest of the country and the community. And there's the responsibility that somebody has to do this. Somebody has to speak for your town and your state and for your institution. And and so I, I would hope that that there are there are phases in American life where university leaders are more outward looking, talking about the fate of the community and more inward looking because the house is burning down. You need to do something about it. And I know that there are still fires to be put out all over academia from enrollment changes to whatever else. And so I admire people who are doing that firefighting drill. But while they're dealing with the fire, I hope they also would would recognize that they have really unusual opportunity and responsibility to talk about these larger interests of education and civic life, education and economic opportunity, education and inclusion, education and all these different things. So I would like to hear, um, <laughs> there's not a lot of groups in American life about whom I say this, but I would like to hear more from university leaders rather than less. Yeah, with all the noise out there, <laughs> you have to be careful who you make that request of. <laughs> that is uh, well said. What's next for you? Are you going to continue this line of, of 
research and, and uh, expose or you have other plans in mind? So I think that there's a um, one of the things that is good about the writing life, which I've pursued uh, since I was in college and, and long, long after that, is you get to your business is learning about the next thing. So um, there, there's been a sequence of things I have learned about from our time in China and Japan and elsewhere when I worked in the technology world uh, that I, I retain interest in and keep writing about. Then there's new things I, I want to keep learning about. I think that Deb and I retain a long-term interest in talking about what are the ingredients in local level American possibility, inclusion, and wholeness. So, you know, in journalism, you're in the business of learning about new things, but continue to pay attention to the old ones. So I still pay attention to China, where I live, and Japan, the technology world. And Deb and I are going to continue to pay attention to the elements of local level renewal uh, versus decay, because it is so crucial to American politics and American economic opportunity and dealing with China and everything else. And I'll say that in the 10 years that Deb and I have been doing this, it's interesting that what we've written about places like Erie or Fresno has gone from being uh, in the views of New York and D.C. It used to be, oh, isn't that cute? And isn't that like the world's biggest cow made out of butter at the Wisconsin State Fair or something like that, to actually recognizing that this is the key to American um, growth and, and resilience. So we're going to we have a little foundation called the Our Towns Foundation, where we continue to write about these issues and and have other people write, too. So this will be an ongoing interest. And also there are uh, continuing things that I'm, I'm writing about. Uh, the future of local journalism is something that is much on my mind right now and seeing finding ways to deal with that and the next stage in U.S. and China dealings. So, so local renewal, local journalism, and U.S. and China are sort of the three next things that are on my mind. Yeah, that's a lot to keep you busy. <laughs> you likened this quote, this sentiment to the life of a writer, but I'm going to quote you because I think that for the student, the higher ed professional, or and or the academic – Business is learning about the next thing. Your business is about learning the next thing. And I think that's a, a call to action and, and also a, a clear sentiment for all of our passions and endeavors in this life. Thank you again for this time, James. This has been a lot of fun for me. I've, I've learned a lot. What's the best way for someone to connect with you or continue to follow you? So thanks so much, Ian, for the opportunity and for letting me uh, be in touch with your audience, your diaspora. And uh, so um, the the best ways I have my my main blog and online site these days is on Substack. See if you're right, fallows.substack.com. You will find my thoughts and everything from aviation safety to uh, technology for <laughs> transcribing interviews. Um, the, uh, the the foundation site Deb and I have is called um, ourtowns.org is, uh, it's our town's foundation. If you look for our town's foundation, you'll see things that we are writing there. Uh, so that is, uh, that's where we are doing our work and we'll hope to come to a town near you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you again, James. Uh, it's been amazing to sit down. Always a pleasure to, uh, to learn from great minds and a true pleasure to have this time with you today. My pleasure and my thanks.